gospel. Chapter 13, we have come to, we're in the last week of Jesus' life on earth in the incarnation. Uh, some speculate that the passage that we are studying today, that it's Tuesday afternoon or Tuesday evening of Passion Week. We're going to be looking at a passage in chapter 13 that's known as the Little Apocalypse. Let me just give you a quick reminder. Uh, apocalypse is just the English uh, transliteration of the, of the term apocalypsis. And apocalypsis means the, means the unveiling. So the last book in the Bible is called the Apocalypse. It's the, it's the Revelation, right? Well, chapter 13 of Mark is called the, the Little Apocalypse. It's a, it's a chapter of predictions that Jesus is making about, about the temple. We're going to look at that today and set a sort of a context for the rest of the chapter. He's making predictions about coming suffering and persecution. And then he makes predictions about his return, the second coming. Uh, and he's going to do this, and if you, if you do any reading and studying in the Gospels, you know that, that this is also called by some the Olivet Discourse, because a lot of it's going to happen from the Mount of Olives looking down, literally, visually looking down upon the temple structure. Mark chapter 13, verses 1 to 4, I hope you found that in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible with you, we want to put one in your hands if you'll ask me after the service, but we have the text on the screen so that no one here can be without the viewing, the reading of the Word of God. We would remind you, God is not promised in the Word that my words will not return void. But He has promised that His Word that goes out from His mouth will not return void. It will accomplish the purpose for which it was set forth. And so we always want to keep the Scripture in front of ourselves. Stand with me, if you would, as I read uh, Mark chapter 13, verses 1 to 4. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings... And Jesus said to them, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Now, you pick up a pause here. They're walking out of the temple. And the next conversation takes place on the Mount of Olives. It took a little while to get to the Mount of Olives. Be there with them. And he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. And Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Now, we need to, I'm going to spend a little time today giving you reading some things I don't typically read. On the temple, I want you to get a picture of what, what they were looking at to understand the significance of what Jesus is saying. So let's sit down and take a look at this passage. I would remind you that in the 12th chapter, Jesus has uh, variously, uh, he's just kind of laid waste to the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, and they've come to him with questions. In fact, they finally stop asking him questions because he, he just embarrasses them so much. And Finally, someone comes, it seems, asking a sincere question, and, and he answers uh, just a, with, a, with a breathtaking answer about the need for loving God and loving others being the, being the summary of the commandments. And then, then he chides these uh, religious leaders for making a pretense, an outward look of religion, and yet he says they, they devour widows' houses. And having talked about devouring widows' houses, we're then told the next a little episode is he's sitting across from the treasury watching the people come to put in the money into that, that, that unusual offering configuration they had. There were 12 trumpet-shaped uh, vials that they would drop the money in that would go down. And this widow comes up and puts in just a little bit, I mean, by comparison of what was being put in, just a little bit, and Jesus commends her. And then he walks out of the temple. Some of the experts on the New Testament suggest that this, was, this may have been the last time he was in the temple. 
So now the reason why I tell you that is, why do, why do the disciples, and, this, and if you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, compare them, uh, Matthew says that uh, the disciples, um, Luke says some, uh, Mark says one, and probably there was a bit of chatter, and Peter spoke up over the others as he, as he had a knack to do. But as you've read this, have you ever wondered why they, why they make this observation? This is, this is my best take on it. Jesus is just laying waste to Judaism. The people who were the most highly regarded in Judaism, Jesus has exposed as frauds. He has previously, in Mark chapter 11, you'll recall, uh, gone into the, to the temple area where they were preparing uh, for the Passover, and he turns over these tables and, and chases out the money changers, says, this, this is to be a house of prayer for all the nations, which is, by the way, how Solomon dedicated it, uh, one of the temples. And you have made it a den of thieves. When Jesus was a child, when he was 12, he, he, he was found in the temple, and, and, and his parents chided him and said, you were, you, you, we were worried. Where in the world were you? And he said, did you not know that I needed to be in my father's house? So for Jesus and for those who have been connected with God, this is the house of God. Well, well the Pharisees, in fairness, the Pharisees, scribes, uh, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, uh, they too saw it as a house of God, but for them it was a house of God whereby they as religious leaders took advantage of the people. And Jesus, as you can tell, if, if, you, if you've been with us and reading through this, you cannot help but feel the intensity. He is, he is ramping it up. He is pushing them into a corner as the cross looms in a couple of days. So I think, <laughs> I think the disciples are, are trying to find something positive to say about Judaism. So they, 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 they admire the impressiveness. We're going to see this, these three things. They, they admire the impressiveness of the temple. Jesus responds by predicting the destruction of the temple. The disciples then desire to know the sign that this destruction is imminent. How will we know this? So let's just look at this. They say in verse 1, As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. Well, let's read about it. What is he talking about? What did it look like? I don't know if any of you have ever been to what is called the Holy Land. I've not had the privilege of going there. I've seen a lot of a video on it. I've read a lot of blogs from friends who have gone. I've uh, seen some of the graphics of it. Just a little history of the temple. David is the one who first conceived in his heart to build a temple to represent the true and living God, Jehovah. Now you remember historically God did not let David do this. He called David a bloody man. David was a man of war and he said, he said you, you're not going to build my temple. And it devastated David. But God said your son Solomon will. So, so Solomon was charged with the responsibility of building the temple. He began to do this in about 969 BC. He finished it in seven years. It was quite an ornate uh, building, set of buildings, the cedar and cypress wood from Lebanon, white hard limestone used in the construction. It was built on, on Moriah, Mount Moriah. Very ornate in its trappings. If you know anything about history, you know that in 586, the Babylons invaded they destroyed it and took all the nice uh, appointments inside of it. Again, following your history, about 50 years after this, there's, uh, the Jews are allowed to return to Jerusalem and they come back to a city that's been laid waste. The walls are also destroyed. One of the first things they do, if you remember, in Ezra 3.3, 3, is they build an altar for a new temple. There's an interesting side note that I was reading about. said that the people who had known Solomon's temple were really never satisfied with what was being rebuilt. I guess buildings have always been an issue for, for the people of God. They grumbled about it. 
They wept about it. In fact, Ezra 3, 12, and 13 says. And so this temple that was built uh, was not as ornate as Solomon's temple, but, but it stood. And this too was plundered and desecrated by Antiochus Epiphanes in 168 B.C. It wasn't leveled and destroyed completely. Uh, Judas Maccabeus, I think three years later, uh, cleansed and rededicated the temple. You may recall Antiochus Epiphanes uh, did something abominable with pigs uh, on the altar, which was, uh, we read in Isaiah earlier. Think about it, if you understand, for God to say through the prophet Isaiah, their offerings are like, like pig's blood. I mean, pig's blood. That's, you don't, a Jew didn't mess with that. That was an unclean animal. Well, Antiochus Epiphanes did that. So Judas Maccabeus cleanses and rededicates it three years later. Then Pompey, the Roman uh, general, captured and entered the temple, uh, 54, 53 B.C., stole its treasures out of it, didn't, didn't destroy it. Then Herod the Great comes on the scene, and he began a complete renovation project of the temple. Uh, in fact, so much so that, the, that Josephus and others said it, it looked like a new temple. It didn't look like the same structure. He began to build it about 19 B.C. Long after his death, it still was not completed. So in our text here today, even as they're talking about it, it is still under the renovation. In fact, it only... It only was finished a few years before it was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, the event that Jesus is referencing that's still in the future. Well, what did it look like? Well, I've provided you with a diagram. Just to let you kind of see a sense of it. It was, it was massive. On the, on the outskirts, along the walls, you're looking at a, at a, <clears throat> a thousand feet by a thousand feet square, three and a third football fields was the complex, with several buildings in it. And I just want to give you a brief description. That four Four entrance areas, several gates you see on different sides. Lining the outer wall were rows of high pillars. They each consisted of a single block of pure white polished marble. Karen and I were talking about, just imagine what it took. What they had to excavate and move and then shape into these beautiful columns. On the east, west, and north, there were three parallel rows of columns. On the south, there were four parallel rows of, rows of columns. Then there were halls uh, moving toward the inner part of it. And beyond these colonnades, uh, moving farther away from the outside wall, there was this very spacious court of the Gentiles. You see that there. Anyone could come into the court of the Gentiles. This was paved with variegated marble of the finest quality. But it was restricted. The Gentiles could go no further, those who were not of Jewish <clears throat> lineage. It was surrounded by, by a four and a half foot high balustrade separating it from the inner courts. And if you had been a Gentile, able to read Greek or Latin, which would have been typical for Gentiles. This is what you would have read on stone after stone after stone separating the court of the Gentiles from the inner courts. Let no man of another nation enter inside the barrier and the fence around the temple. Whoever is caught will have himself to blame that his death follows. Welcome to the temple. Right? 
As you move toward the inner part, you have Solomon's porch. You would cross into a portion of the court of the Gentiles. You see that. Come to the beautiful gate. And then you move into the women's court, you see. Now, Jewish men, Jewish women, and Gentile men and women were welcome in the court of the Gentiles. Women were not welcome past the women's court. When you move and you see Israel's court there, that's the, that's the court of the Jewish men spilling over into the priestly court. There's a dotted line there is because it's hard to know whether, whether there was a real separation between the, what's was called Israel's court where the men were allowed and the priestly court or whether it was just a, just a superficial separation, a low separation. You have the priest court. You see there you've, uh, you've got the altar the labeled, labeled B there, the burnt offering altar. The L is the laver. Uh, the HP is the holy place as you're moving farther and farther inward. And then finally, all the way to the left is the H of H, the holy of holy. So there was a, a veil separating this, this court area, the priest court, from going into the holy place, a big, a big Babylonian curtain set. And then inside, between the holy place and the holy of holies, was this other curtain, the veil. It is this curtain that will be torn. It's made of one solid piece of fabric, and it will be torn from top to bottom when Jesus dies. Very powerful and symbolic. We'll, we'll look at that, though, when we, when we get to that narrative. What about the measurements? Well, the... Uh, the burnt offering, by the way, and this, this huge uh, brazen reservoir was described as resting on the back of 12 big lions, the big, the big L, the labor. The ground floor was 60 cubits high, 60 cubits long, 20 cubits in breadth. You start breaking this up. It was built of white marble, set off with gold on its front and sides. Scriptures, the descriptions external from the Word of God talk about people approaching this, that they, Josephus said you could look upon it, but it would blind you. It was like looking into the sun when you saw the sun reflecting off of the gold exterior of the temple. So you have in that priest court area. This is the sanctuary itself. A few more descriptions. From the court of the Gentiles to that of the women, there was an ascent. So this whole, if you get the picture, it's, it's not 3D there, but it's, it's going up once you're, once you're inside the, the, going from the court of the Gentiles to the court of the women, there's an ascent of 14 steps. From the court of the women to the court of Israel, there's a rise of 15 steps. Then a few more upward steps would bring you to the priest court, 12 more to the entrance of the sanctuary itself, and the highest of the buildings in this complex was the temple of the sanctuary. It was high above the court of the Gentiles. Here's a, here's a picture of the stones used to build it. The stones were 67 and a half feet in length, seven and a half feet in height, nine feet in, in breadth. It was the most elevated ground. Its height was no less than 60 feet. Solomon's temple, by the way, was 45 feet high at this point. Then you add another 60 feet for the upper chamber that covered the entire sanctuary. The whole temple, with the exception of the porch, was covered with a gabled roof of cedar wood. They had golden spikes coming out of it so that birds could not pollute the roof. I guess people have always had problems with pigeons. They just, wherever you go. <laughs> <laughs> 
Josephus says this about its beauty. And Josephus is a historian, Jewish historian. The exterior of the building lacked nothing that could astonish either the soul or the eyes. For being covered on every side with massive plates of gold, the sun had no sooner risen than it radiated so fiery a flash that those straining to look at it were forced to avert their eyes as from the solar rays. To approaching strangers, it appeared from a distance like a snow-clad mountain, the reason being that whatever was not overlaid with gold was purest white. It was built originally by Solomon, rebuilt, and then renovated. The original purpose was to be a house of prayer for all nations. We read Isaiah 66 earlier where God says, where is, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? How, are you, how do you think you'll ever contain me? All these things I have made, they are, they exist because of me, he says. And so you see the transition from the notion that we're building this to declare that our God is great and he's a God who is to be, deserves to be known by all the nations to what happened in the exile when they were carried off into captivity by the, by the Babylonians, 586. They recorded that we hung our harps up on the willows there because, because God was not there. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? In other words, they, had, they thought because they were away from the temple, they had lost the presence of God. So the, the shift has taken place. That somehow they've managed to contain God. Now, brothers and sisters, just parenthetically, that can happen to any people. Whom God blesses, then, then, then we think, well, we, we have a corner on the blessings of God. We have access to God. God blessed us, and he will continue to bless us. He, we deserve to be blessed. It's just, a, it's just a short step from experiencing the blessed nearness of God to presuming that he somehow owes that to us. So that accounts for the harsh words in Isaiah 66 that God is speaking about their worship. It accounts for what Jesus' response is. Let's look at this one. Now that you've seen something of a panorama of the temple, look at Jesus' response. They've said, look what huge stones. <laughs> Rabbi, teacher, I mean, at least the temple is magnificent. Jesus says this. Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. A temple. It's, it's a, the language is a way of talking about total and utter destruction. Don't look to the temple. Don't trust in the temple. Josh is right. They, they, hadn't, they hadn't quite got it yet. You read the prophets, the Son of Man will come to the temple. No doubt they had this wrong messianic hope that Jesus would somehow bring together all the Jewish factions. And you can see that hope just diminishing, waning as he, as he has harsh encounter with the Pharisees, harsh encounter with the Sadducees. You couldn't get those. The only way you got the Pharisees and Sadducees together was to agree to put Jesus to death. That's probably the only time they ever came together. The Herodians, the scribes, the Sanhedrin, the council. Mm -mm, he didn't do that. When the... Uh, when the Romans invaded Jerusalem, Titus, who was the son of Emperor Vespasian, Titus destroyed the temple. It's believed historically that more than a million Jews perished as Rome sacked Jerusalem. And in 70 AD when that happened, Israel as a political unit ceased to exist. 
As a nation specially favored by the Lord, it had reached the end of the road that had been coming for a while. Josephus wrote about this in six volumes on the history of the Jewish war. And this is a passage from one of those volumes. That building, the temple at Jerusalem, however, God long ago had sentenced to the flames. But now in the revolution of the time periods, the fateful day had arrived, the tenth of the month Lewis, the very day on which previously it had been burned by the king of Babylon. One of the soldiers, neither awaiting orders nor filled with horror of so dread an undertaking, but moved by some supernatural impulse, snatched a brand from the blazing timber and hoisted it up by one of, hoisted up by one of his fellow soldiers, flung the fiery missile through the golden window. And when the flame rose, a scream as poignant as the tragedy went up from the Jews. Now that the object which before they had guarded so closely was going to ruin. While the sanctuary was burning, neither pity for age nor respect for rank was shown. On the contrary, children and old people, laity and priests alike, were massacred. The emperor ordered the entire city and sanctuary to be leveled to the ground, except only the highest towers. And that part of the wall that enclosed the city on the west. All the rest of the wall that surrounded the city was so completely leveled to the ground as to leave future visitors to the spot no reason to believe that there had ever that it had ever been inhabited. That's how thorough and comprehensive was the destruction of Jerusalem under Titus, 70 A.D. Jesus said, you see these great stones? They will not stand one day. What he's doing, folks, is he, is he is shaping, retooling their thoughts about how God wins. Now, to their credit, at this point they don't argue with him. So the disciples desire to know the sign. As he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John. Andrew is brought in. Typically it's Peter, James, and John. Andrew, Peter's brother, is brought in now. Four of them. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? To their credit, they believed him. To their credit, they were willing to be retaught. And you see, it's amazing. Because at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, if you want to look at John chapter 2, verses 18 to 22, I told you when we were going through Mark that there are, there are two cleansings of the temple. Jesus cleanses the temple when he begins his ministry, and John records that. And he cleanses it again in, in, toward the end of his ministry. And the disciples should have been making the connection. But look at John 2, 18 to 22. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? What things had he done? He had gone in and totally disrupted the commerce. A place that should have been a place to prepare people, to call people, to worship the true and living God, to make sacrifice to him as a reminder that he, he had spared them, bringing them out of Egypt in the Exodus as an anticipation that without the shedding of blood there can be no remission of sin, they had turned that into a business. I told you about that when we looked at Mark chapter 11. What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it up in three days? John editorially observes, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture 
and the word that Jesus had spoken. The temple was a symbol. Yes, it was to be a, a, a physical house of prayer for all the nations. But when we looked at the chart a while ago, one of the largest portions of it was the portion of the court of the Gentiles. Why do you think God built it like that? It should have stood as a reminder to every Jew entering the temple. You had to pretty much come into the temple through some aspect of the court of the Gentiles. It should have been a reminder that God in, in, intends for his name and his glory to go out through all the nations, all the peoples. And yet these bigoted Pharisees would walk through the court of the Gentiles almost holding their noses. They so despised the Gentiles. And make their way as they imagined to worship. The temple was a symbol of God's love for the nations. And Jesus reminded them of that when he said that the house of God, the temple, was to be a house not of exclusivity, not of bigotry, a house of prayer for all the nations. The Gentiles should have been welcomed into the court. They should have been encouraged to come into the court of the Gentiles. They should have been encouraged to become proselyte Jews, to, to make the next step and, and put, put aside their pantheon of gods that they were probably exposed to and come to embrace the one true living God. And Jesus comes to turn the symbol on its head because the temple, which never was intended to, to be the habitation of God, but a symbol of God's love for the nations, a place where God had specified how he was to be worshipped, Jesus turns that on his head because he comes to lay down his body, the temple of God, raise it up three days later, and then through his apostles teach us that when you confess faith in the crucified and risen Savior, when you come to God on his terms, which are exclusive, which are narrow, that when you do that by grace through faith, then your life, your body becomes the temple of the living God. Paul taught that in Corinthians. Do you not know? That you're not your own? You're bought with a price. Glorify God with your body. Because your body is a temple of the living God. And so when you read what seems to be Jesus' disdain for the temple, it's not that at all. In fact, what you discover is that God had to take some fairly drastic steps to wean people from Judaism, which was an, an incomplete view of God. So he did it. Historically, 70 AD, the temple came down. They had no place to gather as a central focus point to worship. Scattered. They were scattered. It's only in recent history, you've got to know this, that Israel has become a state again. That the people have gathered back to Israel only in recent history. Until that time, they were the diaspora. They, they were, when you read in the, in the book of Acts, they, they, they're coming from around the world. They've already been dispersed. They're further dispersed, dispersed by the persecution. Because the only way you come to God is through the perfect sinless life of Jesus, his death in your place, his burial, his resurrection, trusting in him, not by sacrificial works, tell us, teacher, what will be the sign? 
when this is going to happen. Well, here's, I'm going to leave you with this today. We've talked in the past about prophecy. Prophecy typically is proleptic. What that means is there is a near, nearly immediate fulfillment. Between, the, between 30 AD and 70 AD would be considered nearly immediate fulfillment with an anticipated ultimate fulfillment. And so Jesus is going to teach them about coming persecution. He's going to say some things that are pretty startling. I encourage you to go ahead and read through the 13th chapter of Mark as we get ready to go through these passage, the rest of this passage. He's answering the question, how will we know? Part of the answer is, no one knows. Not the angels, not the Son, not you. So if you're reading anybody that tells you they know, You've already wasted your money. Don't waste your time. But there's indications. And so I want us, as we stay through the rest of this little apocalypse, to uh, be like the sons of Issachar. Able to discern the times in which we live, to know what we, the people of God, how we ought to live, how we ought to be. And there's going to be some very good instructions for us in this passage. But leave here today answering this question. Am I trusting in religious forms, even my going through the motions of religious forms? Am I trusting in that for my hope and my salvation? Or am I trusting in the shed blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ? On Christ the solid rock, is that where you stand? Because all other ground is sinking sand, even religious ground. In whom or in what am I trusting? I've, I've talked to people through the years who are trusting in their, in their baptism. They're trusting in their membership. They're tr None of those things will carry you from this world to the world which is to come, to the celestial city, as John Bunyan described it in Pilgrim's Progress. Only faith, a faith commitment to Jesus Christ will take you to heaven when you die and will give you all you need is the Spirit dwells in you to live a life here of abundance. Don't let the temple distract you <laughs> like it did the disciples. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before you in Jesus' name. Oh, we read the disciples have been with him every day. They still didn't see it. Oh, Lord, please don't let us miss it. Show us Jesus Christ, crucified and risen. And help us to examine ourselves to be sure that we're in that faith, faith in him. to heed the words of Isaiah and to, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that God is the one who works in us so that we can work it out. Oh, Lord, help us oh, we, to be sure we're working out that which you've worked in us. And then, Lord, help us to be wise, to understand the times, not be led astray, not be deceived, not be confused, not be fearful, but to be focused, full of faith, ready, watching, laboring when Jesus comes. We ask it in his name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing as we close. Our